I have actually just in the last hour uh, been cross-examining Philip Hammond as chairman of the European Scrutiny Committee on the question of the renegotiations uh, which are currently under discussion. And um, I had the opportunity when uh, David Cameron made his statement on the 3rd of February uh, to be called second, I think, or third, whatever it was. And the, the bottom line is this, that um, the uh, first thing I said to him was, this is all about voters' trust. I then said, why is my right honourable friend broken so many of his promises and his principles and gave a list of those that he'd done and then ended by saying, and of course you also say that this is legally binding and irreversible. And my committee has been looking at this with uh, great diligence for a number of months and it certainly is not irreversible. And um, the position is that uh, this afternoon we had a session which went on for well over an hour with the Secretary of State uh, for Foreign Affairs, the Foreign Secretary, and uh, I think I can fairly say he had a pretty hard time uh, because um, the trouble is that this is not what they're claiming it to be. I call it the pig in a poke uh, when uh, the first announcement was made. Um, and I maintain that and I mention it again today. Now, what really, therefore, is this all about? I also believe it's a sham because uh, the real question is what is the European Union? And I had the, um, I suppose, the moment of truth in 1989, 1990 when I first saw the Maastricht Treaty. And I came to the conclusion very quickly, it didn't take me very long, that this was creating European government. This was not what people had been voting for in the last referendum we had in 1975. What it did was to create a complete new nexus of law, which through the European Community Act 1972, actually says that we have to obey all laws that come out of the European Union and that we have to also obey all the rulings of the European Court of Justice. Now that was implicit, in fact it was ex explicit, in the European Communities Act itself. But that act hasn't been changed. What's happened is that successive governments, Labour and Conservative, have piled and compressed more and more laws into that small act of parliament so that more and more laws have become part of the overriding law of the European Union. You see, in a nutshell, what's happened is that our democracy has been em emasculated. It is because of the nature of these laws, and it applies, I see Roger Buchel over there, City of London. The other day, we looked at the City of London in our committee, and the bottom line is this, that when the city accepted what's called the De La Rosier Report, which I strongly urge them not to, uh, they effectively absorbed all these laws which were being created and generated in order to impose greater and greater restrictions with some regulation that some people might understand in a certain degrees. But the bottom line is that this mass of law created a lot of very, very serious questions. So we then go off to the Court of Justice. And what happens? The government who has accepted all these laws then finds itself with people who really don't want the laws that have been passed. So they then challenge and go off to the Court of Justice. So we then lose five out of the six cases. And the other case, by the way, is the financial transaction tax. And that's still on the back burner. So really what I'm saying is this, that this massive corpus of law has emasculated our parliament because by virtue of the voluntary decision which was taken in 1972 to absorb 
initial laws, which have now been expanded and increased, we further and further diminished our right to be able to legislate for ourselves. So that raises a very big question, which I uh, put to the um, gathering of the national parliamentary chairman of all the EU affairs committees on Saturday and Sunday this weekend, this last weekend. And I went as chairman of the United Kingdom and each of the others were allowed to speak for one minute. So in a nutshell, in that one minute, I just simply said the reason we're having a referendum is because we want to govern ourselves. And actually, uh, because it, the current Euro European Union, for all the protestations that they want to make it closer to the citizen, actually can't do anything of the kind. The actual architecture prevents you from being able to get closer to the citizen. You've got an unelected commission, you've got a council of ministers, and you, which operates by majority vote, which means by definition that you're going to be governed by the decisions that are taken by other people. And then you've got the European Court of Justice, which applies these laws. So actually, it is fundamentally undemocratic that is the most important point about this. So, I also ask the question, well, what is going to happen if we were to leave the European Union? Now, in a nutshell, we would regain the right to be able to pass those laws for our own citizens. And, you know, people have fought and died in two world wars and before over the question of whether or not we should actually be able to govern ourselves. And we had a debate on sovereignty a few days ago, and I referred back to what happened when, for example, in the Civil War in our 17th century, the king decided that he was going to go into Parliament, because he didn't like what Pym and Hamden and the others were up to on what's called ship money, which was basically to introduce arbitrary taxation by the prerogative, and he took them in, and Mr. Speaker Lenthal said, no, you're not going to do this. And so what happened was that the five members, as they were called, managed to escape. But that was the beginning of a civil war. Now, what is fascinating to me about this, because it's gone on ever since then. After the civil war, we then had a restoration. Then we had the 17th, 18th century. And then we go into the 19th century, when people started to acquire a greater sense of democracy. We had a parliament and it was working to an extent, but it was a parliament for a privileged few. With the repeal of the Corn Laws, people said we are not going to have the imposition of the laws which enable the rich to get richer and the poor not to have any bread, so they sought the repeal of the Corn Laws. That was their decision in their parliament. Then. They went on to say, well, actually, if you can have freedom of choice in terms of trade, because the repeal of the Corn Laws was the genesis of free trade. In fact, John Bright and Cobden went to France and engaged and generated the French Commercial Treaty, which I believe is the first free trade, free trade treaty in the world. They wanted free trade and they did it. Then they decided, right, well, if you can have freedom of choice in relation to trade, which is making people more prosperous, how about this incredible idea that actually the working man should be allowed to have the vote? And that was the Reform Act of 1867. So what had happened was that these people had actually established that it wasn't just the elite that should run the world, or all this country, it was actually the people themselves. And then we can go forward, and then we have the problems, I would say, of the appeasement period as well, when uh, backbenchers, uh, in the shape of Winston Churchill and a few others, uh, very few by the way, actually stood against tyranny. And then we come on to the 1972 Act, and that was done on the basis of that Act which said prefaced by a white paper, we would never, ever give up the national veto. We wouldn't give up the national veto because if we did, do, if we did so, we wouldn't then be able to govern ourselves. And furthermore, that to, uh, to actually uh, abolish the veto over European legislation 
would also mean that, it, as they put it in the white paper, it would endanger the very fabric of the community itself, because they understood that this veto was a defense of national democracy. This was about who governs people and how. And of course, as I've said since then, there's been this enormous explosion of more and more laws. And I heard about the Working Time Directive just now. And I remember saying to uh, the Secretary of State at the time that going by way of some article or a declaration wouldn't stop the European Court from interpreting the Working Time Directive in a way that we've now witnessed. It gets bigger and bigger and worse and worse. So in a nutshell, we actually have to say to ourselves, as I said in this debate the other day, we've reached the point of no return. The European Union doesn't work. The uh, GDP of Europe is going further and further down. There are protests and riots all over Europe. There's massive youth unemployment, up to 60% in some countries. You have got more and more power concentrated in the bureaucrats, both in the Commission and elsewhere, who are actually preventing people from, through uh, restrictions on small and medium-sized business, so forth, from using, as I'm sure you've heard already today, their enterprise and their initiative to enable them to be able to grow their economy, to grow their businesses and so on, by this unnecessary and, and burdensome legislation. And in fact, the most recent figure for the British Chamber of Commerce is that actually it is uh, costing the United Kingdom £30 billion a year in unnecessary and very, very expensive legislation. Furthermore, you can't get rid of any of it because of the nature of this terrible thing they call the acquis communautaire, which is this body of law that can only be changed by universal agreement of all the 28 member states. It is, you're locked into this unbelievable web. And that's why I speak to Ian Mill directly now, because Ian and I were party to that huge rebellion against the Maastricht Treaty for all these reasons. And I'm not going to go into the history of that, but it's actually, that was the beginning of the real attack on this process. But successive governments have actually prevented us by virtue of the whip and various other things, from being able to succeed. So we had to fight for a referendum. And the bottom line is that we eventually got one, and here we are. And now it's down to the British people. It's down to the voter. And what will be, to go back to your uh, logo, the good life after Brexit? I'll tell you what the good life after Brexit will be. And it's not just something that's to do with economics but it's actually about giving back to the British people their birthright for which people fought and died to be able to pass their own laws in their own way and then to ensure that they're governed in the, that manner and that their courts make the decisions and not this European Court of Justice, which is very heavily politicised anyway and increasingly and forever passes its judgments on the basis of what is good for Europe rather than good for individual countries. And I maintain that that is the best thing that could possibly happen. Everything you've heard today, well, I, I haven't heard it all, I'm afraid. I was cross-examining Philip Hammond, as I said. But actually, if you encapsulate everything that you've heard, whether it's the economy, whether it's science, whether it's universities, in every single field, it all ultimately comes down to a question. And that is, who governs you? Who passes those laws? Who enforces them? And a free and democratic United Kingdom Parliament has the capacity to get this right. It did do so until 1972. But then after that, as I said, the laws became many, multiplied many, many times over. And now it is a dead weight. And it is inhibiting and preventing our enterprise. So it is good news. I heard it said just as I was coming in, we want positive news. There is good positive news. It is called freedom, freedom of choice. The right to be able to make your own decisions based on a general election in your national parliament. Not to have it completely suppressed and eradicated by 
de decisions that are taken by unelected people. So in a nutshell, that's my message. It's a good life after Brexit, because actually you'll get back your democracy and you will get back your right to make your own laws. Thank you very much.